had S was a projective algebraic surface. over the complex numbers. And uh, we were considering the moduli space uh, of uh, H-stable rank 2 uh, coherent sheaves on S with joint classes C1 and C2. Coherent, I mean, torsion free sheaves. Uh, with these joint classes. And uh, we also, I also had introduced the Hilbert scheme of points, Sn equal to Hilbert S, which uh, parameterizes geodimensional dimensional subschemes. And uh, I had ended by talking a little bit about obstruction theory and uh, uh, virtual invariance. So for the moment, I just want to recall that this means we have a complex. So just two e minus one to e zero complex of vector bundles. Uh, which somehow capture information both about the tangent space of, uh, say, M uh, and the obstructions to uh, uh, lifting tangent vectors to uh, actual curves, so to deforming points in the moduli space. So, <clears throat> and uh, if I, so I have the virtual tangent bundle, which would be E0 minus E1, where EI is equal to the dual of E upper I. And uh, we had wanted to compute something like the Euler number of these moduli spaces, and this was supposed to be replaced by the virtual Euler number, which would be the evaluation, ah, so if one has uh, such an obstruction theory with these properties, it leads to the existence of a virtual fundamental class. Which will lie in the uh, homology corresponding to the virtual dimension of the moduli space. And so we can integrate any cohomology class over this homology class. In particular, we can take the top churn class of uh, the virtual tangent bundle. And we'll get some number, which is the virtual Euler number. And now uh, we want to see how this, a little, slightly more explicitly, how this plays out for the modelized space of sheaves. So uh, I don't need it, but for simplicity, I will assume that we have a universal sheaf on the moduli space, so let E over S times the moduli space be a universal sheaf. So that would be sheaf so that uh, every, any family of, um, of uh, uh, such sheaves can be obtained by pullback from this. By, by a map to this moduli space. 
But you know, for us, it's maybe enough to say that if you take the universal sheaf and restrict it to S times uh, this thing parameterizes the sheaves. So every point in this would correspond to a sheaf. So if we restrict it to S times the sheaf parameterized, this will be just the sheaf parameterized for E and M. Okay, so this is this universal sheaf. And then I will just write down so what the dual of the obstruction theory is. Can be written as an element in the derived category. So we have, so we look at the projection from S times the modelized space to the modelized space. And uh, then the dual of the obstruction theory is uh, R p lower star of R om E E zero shifted by one in the derived category of M. So this means, um, so this is we have, so an element here would be a, basically a complex of uh, vector bundles on M. And uh, this one means we have shifted it by one to ch exchange, uh, have all the signs the opposite if we look at the alternating sum. And uh, here, what this basically means is that the tangent, uh, so this means trace free. So the, the tangent uh, to the modelized space at the point corresponding to E will be uh, x1 e e trace free and the obstructions will be x2 e e trace free and this is basically what's encoded in this and uh, <coughs> and uh, so here i've said as an element of the right category but one can uh, resolve this so we can write this so can represent this as a complex of vector bundles on M which would be E0 goes to E1 which is uh, just the dual of this so it corresponds to the tension bundle so the virtual tangent bundle um, will be indeed uh, E0 minus E1 in the uh, K group of factor bundles on the modular space. So this is, uh, and so this gives us uh, the following. Uh, by uh, this, what I told you about this general Thing about virtual smooth varieties and obstruction theories. This gives us a, a certain package of things. Uh, namely, so this gives us so we have first that M has a virtual fundamental class. dimension, uh, then we can uh, integrate, uh, we have the virtual tangent bundle as we have seen, so the virtual Euler number of M is the integral over the virtual fundamental class of uh, this thing. So the top churn class. So let me write C V D of M of um, uh, the virtual tangent bundle. And we also have, as I said, a virtual, uh, as I said the other time, a virtual structure C. So M 
as a virtual structure sheaf. So this is O M here, uh, which is just an element in the Grotendi group of sheaves, of coherent sheaves on the moduli space. And this allows us for any vector bundle, so our complex of vector bundles on M, we can compute, uh, we can define the virtual holomorphic Euler characteristic. So this would be chi here of M V. This is just the holomorphic order characteristic, the usual one, so the alternating sum of the sheaf cohomologies uh, over M of V tensor, the virtual structure sheaf. And one nice property that this has, which one has to use for these things is that we have the analog of the usual riemann roch theorem. So, virtual riemann roch namely that the virtual holomorphic Euler characteristic will be equal to the elevation on the virtual fundamental class of the churn character of V times the tot genus of the virtual tangent bundle. I mean, I expect you are familiar with these, so the churn, uh, so these are certain expressions in the churn classes of these things, which are kind of standard. So one can compute this by this formula in terms of cohomology of uh, just the churn classes of the tangent bundle, the virtual tension bundle and the, and V. And this is the analog as the of the usual Riemann Roch. If one just gets rid of the two vias here, one gets the usual Riemann Roch. I mean the three vias. This you know, if you cancel this, this and this, you have the usual Kitzbuch Riemann Roch form. Okay. Now in this context, our conjecture is that this Waffer-Witten formula holds for these virtual invariants, so the, for the virtual Euler number. So uh, I should say, uh, I should remind you that our assumption for this was that the first Bertin number of S was supposed to be zero, and we were assuming that the geometric genus of S was bigger than zero, so that means there, there are holomorphic two forms, I mean, every, uh, there are global holomorphic two forms on S, and I will also assume that H stable is equal to H semi stable so that the modelized space only consists of stable sheaves. And for simplicity of the formulation, I also assume that uh, the canonical linear system contains an irreducible curve. So that means there is a curve C, which is irreducible, so in just one piece, uh, which uh, is a zero set of a holomorphic two-form. And in this case, the assumption, for the, the statement was that this virtual Euler characteristic of M, so I may be right out, M, S, H, C1, C2, is equal to the coefficient of X to the virtual dimension of M of, uh, now let me use eight times one over this eta bar of 
x squared to the 12, 2 times. This is total holomorphic order characteristic of s times 2 times eta of x to the 4 squared divided by the standard theta function to ks squared, where maybe I should remind you that eta bar of x was the product 1 minus x to the n over all positive integers, and this theta function was just the sum over all n in the integers of x to the n squared. So a standard Jacobi theta function. And uh, just to remind you also, the virtual dimension of this modelized space was just the number 4c2 minus c1 squared minus 3 times the holomorphic order characteristic. Okay, so this is the statement. So we will want to um, kind of check the conjecture in many cases, but we are not going to prove it. We will just be able to make computations that confirm it. And um, so we want to check this conjecture and refine it. Maybe I can first look at the refinement. So what would be a refinement? So the Euler number is kind of the more or less the coarsest topological invariant that you can assign to a topological space. So you can look at finer invariants. Uh, and so one particularly nice one one can look at is the chi y genus. So let me do it for the chi y genus. So Uh, so, do you want to, so refinement, replace uh, the Euler number by the chi y genus. So, the chi y genus uh, is usually, so if x is a smooth projective variety, then the chi y genus can be expressed in terms of Hodge numbers. So, so we have these Hodge numbers, HPQ of x, which are, say, the dimension of HP of x and the holomorphic, the sheaf of holomorphic Q forms. Uh, and uh, then the chi y genus of x will be just the sum over all p and q. We have a partially an alternating sum uh, of these Hodge numbers. Okay, like this. And um, I can also write this, uh, you know, as this is uh, the homology of this, uh, this, it means we are looking at the holomorphic order characteristics of these sheaves and summing them up. So this is the same as the sum over all Q of the holomorphic uh, minus Y to the Q, the holomorphic order characteristic of X omega Q of X. So it's easy to check that if I put Y equal to 1, Then, then I get the Euler characteristic. And now we want to uh, consider a virtual version of this. And this is just by done, done by putting the letters there at the correct places. Um, maybe, okay, so just in case, well, no. So just as an example, if I take the chi y genus of a K3 surface, uh, then this is 2 plus 20y uh, plus 2y squared. And the Euler number, as everybody knows, 
is 24, which uh, uh, is, uh, fits this. <coughs> so let's look at the virtual chiral gene. So this is just as follows. Um, so assume that we are now dealing with our modelized space. Uh, OK, hope it's still alive. <coughs> it still works? OK. Um, <coughs> so. We put, uh, it's clear, in some sense clear, what the holomorphic, the virtual holomorphic P form should be. So, this should be just uh, omega P there on M. Should be just it, uh, P a product of the dual of the virtual tension bundle. And uh, so we just replace this in our formulas. And uh, so then I get the virtual high y genus. Um, I renormalize to make the formulas nicer. So I divide by y to the virtual dimension divided by 2. Uh, times the sum over all p minus y to the p, and then I take the virtual holomorphic Euler characteristic of our modelized space uh, with these holomorphic p forms. Okay, so this is the direct analog of this formula, except that I have normalized it here. And again, it's easy to see for instance, by this riemann roch formula, that if I take this virtual holomorphic Euler characteristic and put y equal to 1, this is the virtual Euler number. And so now, for the virtual ky genus, we will write a very similar formal formula. So we put now Okay, so it is, surprisingly, it is a finite sum. That's not obvious from the definition. So obviously, by definition, the sum is infinite because uh, you know, as it's a difference of two classes in the, um, in, in the uh, or, or, you know, of two vector bundles, there are infinitely many terms. It's symmetric powers and alternating terms. But you can prove that uh, this, uh, uh, beyond the virtual dimension, it will actually be zero. I mean, this number will be zero. It just follows from the computing with churn numbers. I mean, from the riemann roch theorem. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, it's not obvious from this. No, you could. It's actually somewhat surprising. But <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so anyway, we put, now we look again at this theta function, theta, uh, now we, before we had the, the theta function as was the theta zero value. Now we have the Jacobi theta function, which also has elliptic variable. And so this would be now sum n in z, x to the n squared, y to the n. And um, we have still our eta bar of before. And then the formula, well, we actually, okay. And then we put psi s have enough room of x, y to be, we take uh, this power, 3 minus chi of s plus ks squared times 1 over the product over all n bigger than 0, 1 minus x to the 2n to the 10, 1 minus x to the 2n y 
1 minus x to the 2n y to the minus 1. We take this to the power chi of s, so the holomorphic order characteristic, and we multiply this by, we have again this eta of x to the 4 squared divided by this theta function. I hope I have enough room. And then I take this to the power well, to the power ks squared. Okay, so this was a square. So this is this formula. As you see, it's the same formula as before. If we put y equal to 1, we get our previous, uh, I mean, let me first write out the statement, uh, which is the same as before, namely, then uh, the conjecture is that the high y genus of this modelized space is the uh, coefficient of x to the virtual dimension of n of this expression. Okay, so this now will be an expression. So it will be polynomial in y if I take the coefficient of x to the vd. And so this is the same formula as before. If we put uh, y equal uh, to 1, this will just be eta of x squared to the 12, as we had before. And this, theta f and, and this theta function here will also just become the theta 0 value when y is equal, put equal to 1. And so uh, this generalizes the previous formula. <coughs> OK. <coughs> there will be, uh, there are further uh, Refinements one can let me just see where am I? There would be uh, so this is uh, there would be further refinements of the, so just one example where we know that this conjecture is true. So if S is a KC surface, then it is known that. Uh, uh, under our assumptions that stable is equal to semi-stable and so on, it's uh, known that this modelized space is a non-singular of the expected dimension. And um, it is actually, for instance, by uh, Yoshioka and Others, one knows that uh, <coughs> it's deformation in equivalent to the Hilbert scheme of points on the surface of the same dimension. So, in particular, the chi y genus of uh, this thing will be equal to the, that of the Hilbert scheme of points of. Uh, the virtual dimension uh, by, by 2, because we know that the dimension of the Hilbert scheme is twice the number of points. And uh, uh, then ks squared is equal to 0, and this formula here is uh, the standard formula for the... Uh, ah. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. <laughs> so... Yeah, I should maybe have, shouldn't have given this example. So this is this is an example of the formula in the case when the formula doesn't apply, because we had assumed that uh, the uh, uh, that uh, that we had an irreducible canonical curve. So so therefore here k of s x is equal to two, and here k s squared is equal to zero. So we get a factor two here. So we're actually wrong by a factor of two, but still this is precisely what the formula, the general formula, predicts. Okay. What? So you said it's the modular space of rank two. Or yeah. Three. yeah. If I increase the rank, do I have similar conjectures? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, so we have worked it out in rank three what the statement is. 
I will maybe, if I have time, explain it later. Uh, I mean, there's a somewhat more complicated formula. There's some formula by some physicists in arbitrary rank, but that contradicts our formula in rank three. So uh, therefore, uh, uh, as far in, you know, as far as we are concerned, there's a formula only up to rank, rank three. And uh, okay. Well, I mean, yeah, no, no, but that, that's an arbitrary rank. Uh, and, and so the formula is always done in such a way that it contains such a factor which accounts for the Hilbert scheme, for the K3 surface. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so slow. So there are also further generalizations, which I think will not speak about, so one can also generalize this uh, to elliptic genus. And to some extent to the cubordism class. But um, so there's a formula for the elliptic genus, which is uh, in expresses it, uh, the ellip which is very similar to the Dykov moore in the formula for the, the elliptic genera for Hilbert schemes of points on the K3 surface. But it's a bit complicated. It takes rather long to write, so I will maybe not do that. <clears throat> okay. Now maybe I want to try to explain how we uh, try to verify these conjectures. And so this is based on Mochizuki's formula. So this is uh, our principal tool. So this uh, computes intersection numbers on uh, modelized basis of sheaves. In terms of um, intersection numbers and Hilbert schemes of points. And cyber quitten invariants. So I should maybe say it computes virtual intersection numbers. So the integral over the virtual fundamental class of some cohomology class. Okay, so maybe I can briefly recall the cyber quitten invariants. Just not much, but just uh, some make some statements about them. So these are some C infinity invariants of four manifolds. Of differentiable four manifolds. But in, if the four manifold is an algebraic surface, they are actually quite simple. Um, so, in particular, if S is a smooth projective surface, um, and we make our assumption that the geometric genus of S is bigger than zero and the first petty number of S is zero. Uh, they are rather easy to compute. And uh, I mean, at least in many examples, one can directly, uh, they are well known. So anyway, so the zabek witten invariants can be viewed as a map, as W from the second cohomology to the integers. So a class A is sent to 
the zabak witten invariant of A. I should maybe say that in gauge theory, uh, it's a bit different. You associate a zabak witten invariant to a spin C structure, and spin C structure would be a characteristic cohomology class, so one which is, uh, say, congruent modulo 2 to the canonical class. And uh, so the relation of this to the standard ones is that our cyber witten invariants are equal to the standard ones uh, uh, for 2A minus k. Anyway, in gauge theory. But anyway, this is just for some explicity of notation. And so we have this map. Most of the time, uh, most of class, the classes are mapped to zero. And so if the zabak witten invariant of A is non-zero, then A is called the zabak witten class. And uh, I just give some examples. So, so first, if S is a K3 surface, then there's only one cyber Quitten class, only cyber Quitten class. And this is actually the class zero in the second cohomology. Is the Zabak Witten invariant is one. Uh, if um, this is, if we have a cano uh, an irreducible canonical curve, uh, then we have only two Zabak Witten classes. The zero anti canonical class and uh, the Zabak Witten invariant of zero is again one, and the Zabak Witten invariant of Ks is minus one to the holomorphic Euler characteristic of S. So everything is known. And there are other statements. For instance, if we blow up a surface in a point, we have a simple relation between the Zabak Witten invariant. So if S hat is the blow up of S in a point, then the Zyberg Witten invariant of S hat, are, uh, the Zyberg Witten classes of S hat are so these are. A, set of all A and A plus E, where E is the exceptional divisor. Of this blow up, and um, A is the Zyberg Witten class on S. So for this, I mean A is the pullback from S. So if you, uh, of, of A on S. Okay, uh, there are other examples, for instance, we have a simple description for elliptic surfaces, but maybe I will not write it. So you can see at least it's very, uh, they are quite simply described in a quite simple way. In particular, if I uh, assume that Ks contains an irreducible curve, then I know explicitly what the Zabak Witten invariants are. And uh, this is the reason why I restrict uh, in this presentation my attention to the case that it contains an irreducible curve. Otherwise, we also have a formula, but uh, it will be more complicated, some formula in terms of the Zabak Witten invariants. OK, so this is the first part. And now we have to kind of, the Mochizuki formula is unfortunately rather complicated. Uh, 
Um, so first, just see. Yeah, first we have to remember all these tautological sheaves that also were mentioned in uh, Noah Arbelsfeld talk. So we have a S, a projective surface with a, so our usual assumption. So we look at this diagram. Assume we have here SN1 times SN2. So the Hilbert scheme of N1 points and 2 points times S. We can project it to S and we can project it to these Hilbert schemes. So this I call P. So then we have several things. We have um, universal sheaves. We have several universal sheaves. So the first thing is the ideal sheaves. So if we have Z and S, so the universal subscheme, which is just can be described as the inside uh, S times the Hilbert scheme of n points, this pairs of a point in S and a subscheme <coughs> such that the point lies in the subscheme. So this incidence variety, uh, this uh, is a uh, maps to this n and uh, the fiber over every point here will be the subscheme parameterized. So this is the universal family. And so um, we can look at its ideal sheaf. IZNS, which is so the ideal sheaf in S times SN, so the functions in this ambient space which vanish on it. This is the universal ideal sheaf. Um, <clears throat> and so we can use this to make some sheaves, some ideal sheaves on this product here. So if um, L is a line bundle, on S, uh, we can put for the II of L to be so. Yeah, now I don't. So in this case, I actually I take this ideal sheaf. So assume in this situation uh, of the ni ideal sheaf, so the factor. I take here the projection to S times S and I. So I is equal to one or two. Um, the pullback by that of the ideal sheaf of N I the of the universal subscheme, and I tensorize this with the pullback of the line bundle. So this will be uh, some sheaf on, uh, so I have pulled it back, so this is some sheaf on this product. And what is the property? So this is a sheaf on S times SN1 times SN2 with the property that if I restrict it to the point corresponding to uh, so restricted to S times the point corresponding to two subschemes. Uh, this will be the ideal sheaf of the ith subs of these two subschemes tensorized with L. Okay, so this is one thing we can look at, and we can also look at 
the tautological sheaves, which were considered in Noah's talk, So we have here this universal family. It maps to S. No, it lies, after all, in the product of S times Sn. One can look at this. Uh, this map was called pi now. And I can look tautological sheaf on this thing would be the push forward with P, the pullback of L in this diagram. We first pull back this line bundle here to this thing. We push it forward, it becomes a vector bundle of rank N. And so, so this is a vector bundle of rank N on this Hilbert scheme uh, such that if I look at the fiber of this thing over the point corresponding to a subscheme Z, this will be H0 of this line bundle restricted to Z or tensor OZ. There's a vector span. And we define then in the same way O1 of L and O2 of L to be the pullbacks to the product. So these are uh, vector bundles on SN1 times SN2 by uh, pulling back from the two factors, so OI of L is equal to P, uh, say, SNI upper star of this sheaf. OK. So we have uh, all these sheaves on it. We have the total logical sheaves uh, pulled back from the two factors, and the same for the ideal sheaves. And we want to express things in terms of all of them. <coughs> Maybe we, I sh we first should talk about what kind of classes. So I said that the Mujizuki formula will uh, compute intersection numbers on the uh, on the modelized space in terms of um, intersection numbers on Hilbert schemes. So let's first see what classes we want to compute. So uh, we, I assume again that we have a universal sheaf. Then uh, uh, we can look at the two projection to S and to M. And if you have a class in the uh, cohomology of S, we can uh, pull it back to the product. We can multiply it by a churn class of the universal sheaf, and we can push it forward. So we put, so for, we put uh, tau i of alpha equal so the push forward to M via M of, uh, say, the ith churn class of the universal sheaf uh, times this class alpha. So the pullback of the class alpha. So this will be a cohomology class in the 2i of the churn class minus 
4 because of the uh, dimension of S uh, plus K of the model I space. And now uh, we take any polynomial in these classes. So I Z equals zero and alpha in the cohomology of S. And for any such uh, class, we can compute the corresponding virtual intersection number. So, Mochizuki's formula uh, compute. So this virtual intersection number for any such polynomial, uh, so on Hilbert schemes of points. Okay. Now the formula is a little bit complicated. So, and in fact, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, these uh, churn classes of these tautological sheaves and universal ideal sheaves that we have introduced. So explicitly, we have the following. So, if we again look at this pi from S times Sn1 times Sn2 to Sn1 times SN2. I'm not sure whether I actually should write the formula. Hmm. So then, first, if we have two sheaves, E1, E2, uh, sheaves on this product, on this triple product, uh, we can redefine uh, this object. Q of E1, E2, which is the Euler class of uh, minus the R pi push forward of the R home of E1, E2. Okay, so this is a certain cohomology class that one gets for any two sheaves like this. And we also, okay, then um, yeah, maybe should also introduce this, although it will maybe, so for us, we also have a variable in this thing Um, if E is a vector bundle, um, say of a certain rank, <coughs> so then we could say that CK of E of S would be kind of for the moment defined as uh, Of uh, this expression, okay. So how you think of this? So in fact, you treat this variable S as if it was a line bundle, and E of S means you tensor by the line bundle, and this gives a formula for so for the churn class of this, if this is also the first churn class of the line bundle. And this makes actually complete sense because actually S is a line bundle. Um, namely, we are looking at a trivial line, an equivalent line bundle whose um, 
which is trivial as a line bundle, but is non-trivial non equivalently. And this S is actually its equivalent first join class. And this actually means we tensorize E with this equivalent line bundle. And this is the formula for the equivalent join classes. So anyway, but uh, if one doesn't know what this is, it's just this formula. And um, <coughs> so with this, Uh, what? With this, um, we have for line bundles A1, A2 on S, we can write psi A1, A2, N1, N2, S to be some Newton expression. Remember that we had this P of E that we wanted to compute the integral over m of p of e. And so we take this p of e, so, and replace the e by taking this first ideal sheaf, tensorizing it by the line by a1 minus s plus the second. So basically, we have replaced e by this thing. We divide it by this q thing. with the same contents. And uh, then we multiply by the Euler class of uh, O1 of A1. So this was a tautological bundle times the Euler class of O2 of A2 plus 2S. And then, as a normalization, we divide by some power of 2s. <coughs> so this will be the sum expression. It will turn out, so this lives according to our definition. Somehow we are in the cohomology of the, this product of these two Hilbert scheme of points with q coefficients. And, uh, uh, so we have all these S's, that we get a Laurent series in S. Okay, so this is this expression. And then uh, we can, as is like this, we can integrate it over these Hilbert schemes of points. So we put A of A1, A2, say N. Is that what I want? Yeah. S yes. to be the sum over all numbers such that n1 and n2 add up to n of the integral over the Hilbert scheme, the product of these two Hilbert schemes of this expression. So this is just something we have written down. So this will be according to what we have here. This is some uh, powers in each series, in some Laurent series in S. And um, so then the statement of Mutsubiki's formula is that in terms of this, we can compute our integral Namely, we assume, again, that all sheaves in MS, H, C1, C2 are stable. Um, we assume um, that the holomorphic Euler characteristic of every sheaf in, uh, in the modelized space is positive. And uh, so this can always be achieved by the modelized, if we twist the a sheaf, if we sh twist every sheaf in the modelized space by a line bundle, this gives me an, an isomorphism of the modelized space to itself. And um, 
so we can always twist in such a way that every sheaf has positive homomorphic order characteristic. Uh, and then for then for polynomial P as above, we have that if we want to evaluate this over the virtual fundamental class, this is equal to the sum over all ways how I can split up the first churn class here as a sum of two classes where A1, H, so H is our ample class, is smaller than A2, H. And I multiply by the zabek whitney range of A1, and I take the coefficient of S to the zero of this A thing here, A, uh, A1, A2. And then N is replaced by the second churn class we have here, minus A1 times A2, so which is a number, because these are class and second cohomology, uh, comma S. Okay, so this is the answer. <coughs> so one can, for one thing, so I think my time is essentially up. So in particular, uh, we will be able to see that we can have this, for instance, the uh, top churn class of the virtual tangent bundle can be expressed in this way. And uh, so one can apply it to compute uh, the virtual Euler number. And so what we have achieved here uh, is that we have a, a reasonably, we started with a reasonably nice formula on this uh, modelized space of sheaves, so of, of an intersection number on, on a modelized space of, of sheaves. And we have replaced it by a terrible formula on uh, the Hilbert scheme of points. And uh, so that doesn't really seem like a big improvement, but we will see uh, next time that one can actually work with it. Okay, thank you very much.